Hello, and welcome to this special edition of A Health Podacy. I'm your host, Alan Weil, and today we're doing something new. We're recording our podcast live as part of Health Affairs Policy Spotlight event series. This series features wide-ranging conversations with influential health policy experts in Washington, D.C. and beyond. My guest today is Mina Seshamani, Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Medicare at CMS. Dr. Seshamani was my guest on a policy spotlight last year, but given how much Medicare-related news there is these days, we thought it was good to have you back. And there's a lot to talk about, Medicare Advantage, prescription drug prices, the value-based care agenda, and I'm sure we'll cover more. Now, before coming to CMS, Dr. Seshamani was Vice President of Clinical Care Transformation at MedStar Health and an Assistant Professor at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. She has her BA from Brown University and MD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, PhD in Health Economics from the University of Oxford, where she was a Marshall Scholar. So both an economist and, and I, I always get this wrong, otolaryngology sur surgeon, the best I can do as a non-clinician. She's practiced at Kaiser Permanente in San Francisco, served as director of the Office of Health Reform at the US Department of Health and Human Services. Now, I will say, because we're doing both a podcast and a policy spotlight, if you are in our live audience, you can submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. I will do my best to weave them into the conversation. It's helpful if they are short and of general interest. And if you get them to me before the closing bell, an hour from now, so I have time to ask them. Uh, with those preliminaries, Dr. Seshamani, uh, it's so great to have you back for another Policy Spotlight, and welcome also to A Health Policy. It's it's great to be back. Thanks for having me, Alan. <clears throat> so, Mina, you and I have worked together enough. I hope I can call you Mina. Yes. Um, you know, when you came on before, you were talking about your agenda, and here we are uh, deep into it. Just to provide a little structure to our conversation, uh, tell me what you view as your top priorities, and we'll start working through some of them, and I'll dig a little deeper as we go. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Alan, you know, building off of our last conversation, you know, Medicare really plays a critical role in driving change in our healthcare system, right? As the largest payer, almost a trillion dollars in claims, partnering with a million clinicians, 6,000 hospitals. So, you know, really our agenda has been how we can leverage Medicare and utilize the Medicare program to really drive change, not only for the 64 million people who rely on the Medicare program, but also what you know path that sets for the broader system. Thinking about how we can advance health equity such that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to obtain their optimal health, regardless of the various characteristics that come into play in influencing someone's health or their ability to access health care how we can expand access to coverage and care, driving innovation for high quality, whole person care, and being good stewards of the Medicare program. And you mentioned, you know, in your intro, kind of three big areas in which we are driving change. Medicare Advantage, implementation of the new prescription drug law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and all the work we're doing in uh, transforming care through our value-based care initiatives, and also through our, you know, underlying uh, traditional Medicare program as well. So I'm sure we can dive into any and all of that. <laughs> well, let's let's uh, do exactly that. So I think it's good to take them in the order uh, that you mentioned. I guess I kicked it off that way. Uh, Medicare Advantage, you know, it's uh, half the program now. Um, and I don't think even its biggest uh, boosters at the time, and of course they're precursors to MA, uh, but I don't think we ever thought we'd get to this point. And it, um, so it becomes important in its own right. And just as you said that Medicare is a, a tool and opportunity to affect the entire healthcare system, the play between MA and, and traditional Medicare also uh, there's a mutually reinforcing and uh, as well as sort of a competitive element to them. So why don't we start if you could just tell me what's top of your mind on MA and then I'll probably ask you a few questions about the items on my mind. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, piggybacking off of what you said, Alan, Medicare Advantage plays a very important role in the Medicare program, right? When I think about the Medicare program, 
There is Medicare Part A and B for traditional fee-for-service Medicare. There's Part C, Medicare Advantage, Part D, prescription drug coverage, and then the Medigap and supplemental policies. And you know, my goal is to make sure that we have a robust set of options that are all geared towards serving the person with Medicare, driving the kinds of the kind of vision, um, the collective vision that we all have. And so to that end, um, last year we put out a request for information um, in the Medicare Advantage program. The first time that we put out there and said, hey, we want to discuss what's working, what isn't, and really engaging everybody who's involved in this space. So health plans, providers, patient groups, employers, academics, and we got more than 4,000 comments from that request for information. And those comments and that feedback that we got really has formed the foundation of some of the policymaking that we've been doing. Again, driving towards those pillars. So for example, where we now have for health equity, have created a health equity index in the Medicare Advantage program under the STAR ratings so that health plans that are caring for underserved populations, if they meet the quality metrics, they can be eligible for additional reward. You know, in line with what we're doing elsewhere in fee-for-service as well, so that we can reward excellent care for underserved populations. We heard a lot about the confusion that's been created with potentially misleading marketing practices. That's something that we heard from absolutely every single you know, group out there. And so we um, proposed and finalized policies to rein in misleading marketing practices, saying you can't use the Medicare logo in a misleading way. You have to say which plans health plans you are representing, you know, and other, you know, policies like that. We also heard from many different groups about prior authorization, where plans wanted to have clearer rules of the road of what kinds of utilization management they can do. Providers commented on the incredible burden that some of the prior authorization was creating, and patients expressed that they felt they couldn't get access to medically necessary care. So we also put out policies saying, look, the prior authorizations must follow traditional Medicare national coverage decisions or local coverage decisions. Where there isn't one, then you have to follow publicly available widespread clinical evidence and have you know regular yearly updates and review of the clinical protocols again to try to make sure that all of what's happening in Medicare Advantage is really serving uh, the people that we intend to serve. So those are just you know a few examples from our rule and then you know we heard a lot about payments and the importance of payment accuracy. So in the latest rate announcement, we had finalized to update the data years from using 2014 to 2019 in the risk adjustment model to update the diagnostic nomenclature to move from ICD-10, from ICD-9 to ICD-10, and then also to take a look at what the coding patterns are between Medicare Advantage and fee-for-service to really utilize those codes that are associated with incremental costs of treatment so that payments can be more accurate. And those are changes to the payment, to the risk adjustment model that are getting phased in, you know, over the next three years. Again, just, and that really comes to how do we improve equity? How do we improve quality? How do we make sure people have good choices so they can get the care they need? And how do we make sure we're being good stewards of the program? So I really like that the agenda is driven by an RFI and you mentioned things like prior authorization and marketing, which don't tend to be uh, what fill the pages of health affairs. We get a lot on this sort of uh, pricing accuracy um, and not just around risk adjustment, but the broader practices for how MA rates are set. Um, so I am going to sort of slide over in that direction and mm -hmm. ask you a couple of questions. I mean, at one level, and you know, we've published a lot on this. At one level, I feel like we're sort of caught in an infinite loop, uh, and we get a, we have a lot of infinite loops in health policy, where uh, many, again, there are outliers on all of this, but many people would say MA plans are probably paid too much, 
but they are also probably in the aggregate more efficient. Now, some of that efficiency comes from things that are annoying, like narrowing networks and prior authorization. But if you're if you're going to save money, you got to do it some way. Um, but then they then you get caught in this whole thing. Well, where does that money go? And you get all these extra benefits available to you if you're in an MA plan, but you may be subject to some some marketing that isn't quite right. Um, so I'm trying to think about, you know, is there a way out of this sort of too much, too little, should grow, should shrink? And and so I'm interested in your general uh, mm -hmm. reaction to that framing. Maybe I'll stop there because I have a few more specific questions. Well, you know, Alan, I think what you said points exactly to why we are looking at things like prior authorization and marketing in additional in addition to the payment, because ultimately what you want is to pay accurately for the services that people need to drive the kind of innovation that's going to lead to higher quality care. And so that requires, number one, more transparency in what is happening in the Medicare Advantage program. So for example, now we're requiring medical loss ratio reporting for supplemental benefits, right? Okay, so there is money that's going towards supplemental benefits and is that being utilized? Being able to lend more transparency so we can see what's working and what isn't. And also how can we make sure that that money coming in is being used for care? Hence, looking at network adequacy. We recently, increase network adequacy requirements, particularly around behavioral health, so that licensed clinical psychologists and social workers have to be part of you know, MA networks. The prior authorization, where you have clear rules of the road of where medically necessary care must be allowed um, in Medicare Advantage, so that we can make sure that we're paying accurately, more accurately by the risk adjustment model, and that we're really driving those improvements in care and improvements in access. And so really thinking about that all together is very important. So uh, I that, that all makes sense to me. And yet when you talk about updating from 2014 to 19, I think, boy, you know, we're always looking in the rearview mirror. I get that. Is it time to think about MA rate setting sort of as a distinct phenomenon than fee-for-service, the, the using fee-for-service as the platform as it shrinks? I mean, what if it's a third of the program? What if it's clearly no longer representative of the population? Do you have a long-range thought about where we go with this? I think these are all questions that all of us have to think about. And it, it's a combination of you know, statutory authority where there are things in the Medicare law for Congress and where there are things that we have administrative authority to do. You know, I always like to remind everyone, Medicare is kind of a three-part program, right? You have Medicare law at like the 50,000 foot level, which sets the general parameters, guidelines, where we then in the administration have the authority to be able to put out regulations at say the 25,000 foot level to really guide the program to then where care takes life on the ground with providers and patients and others who are you know caring health plans that are caring for people and so you know the question that you're raising of how rates are determined in Medicare Advantage is a combination of what Medicare law says and where there are, you know, administrative authorities and flexibilities. And absolutely, this is something that we want to continue to explore, you know, where we have the authorities and explore it with everybody involved. You know, we have really had an open door policy to hear from health plans, from providers, from academics, from patient groups of what's working and what isn't so that we can incorporate that information as we all figure out together what is the best path forward. And that's something we're very open to continuing to discuss. Well, you know, this may fall more in the value-based uh, section of our discussion, but we don't need to have firm boundaries here. You know, one question about sort of the ACO program and things of, of its ilk, but that's obviously a, a clear and, and well-defined and long-standing one is, the role of the patient or the enrollee that in MA, you have this natural pathway of saying, if you come over here, there are certain things we can offer you um, in, in supplemental benefits and the like. And, and when it comes to a lot of the other things we're doing like ACOs, 
we don't assign you. You may not even know about that's what you, how you're getting your care. We're certainly not giving you any incentive to participate in it as a patient. All the incentives are over on the provider side. So is there a way to think about, again, as you're taught, you're, I, I, I always like when I talk to you because you start with what are we hearing from the patients and the enrollees. Is there a way to think about, um, again, a continuum from sort of total unfettered access to anything you want, but the costs associated with that, you know, over here maybe is MA, but but there are structured options in the middle that that a, that a patient enrollee would say, yeah, I know where I am. I don't want to be over here, but I also don't want to be over here, and I want to get some of the benefits of that. Is that a viable path? Yeah, I think this comes back to how do you make sure that people understand what their options are so they can choose what's best for them, right? Where in fee-for-service, you have, you know, access to a full, you know, network of providers, right? That you don't have that, that narrowing, um, you know, on the Medicare Advantage side where there are supplemental benefits, these are things that people have to weigh. And there are huge opportunities to improve how we're co communicating and aligning across them. You know, I like to joke that if you walk on the street and you ask a you know, 67 year old walking down the street, hey, what do you think about that value-based care program? They're not gonna know what you're talking about, right? But instead, being able to talk about, you know, if your healthcare provider is in an accountable care organization, what does it mean for you? It means that your doctors are talking to each other. You're less likely to have medical errors. You're less likely to have duplicate procedures. You know, you could have somebody who maybe comes to your home and is able to see like a community health worker and to see what's going on in your community to help support your health. And that has been a concerted effort for us to be able to improve how we're describing these programs through the Medicare and You Handbook, through the materials that accountable care organizations provide um, to their patients, and where there are opportunities for us to be able to better lay out like here here are the various options you have because as you know one of our goals in value based care is to have 100% of people in traditional medicare in an accountable care relationship where they are working with a healthcare provider who is being held accountable for the cost and quality of their care and really taking that broader view than just a okay this person's coming into my office for 15 minutes with this ic 10 code with this ENM code, and then I call it a visit, right? And that means that you would have traditional Medicare in this kind of more holistic care arrangement. And we also want to drive Medicare Advantage to make sure they're having, you know, those more holistic care arrangements. And that's an area that we are exploring as well. We had questions in our RFI about it. We had um, request for comment in our, you know, C and D rule of how do we encourage, you know, more of those kinds of holistic relationships in Medicare Advantage as well? Because for us, it's about the Medicare program. So we really want to try to align across the programs as well. Uh, I know this is a little deep in the weeds, but uh, and I know I know you love health affairs, but I don't expect that you read every paper uh, the moment <laughs> it comes out. We did have a recent paper on the growth of DSNP lookalikes, and it it is a, mm -hmm. sort of the the combination of all of these subjects you've been talking about. That uh, that what we're seeing is that even as we're trying to promote integration of care for people who are duly eligible uh, uh, with Medicare and Medicaid that there is a marketing opportunity for MA plans to not have to have all of the integration of a dual eligible special needs plan, a DSNP. Um, they can offer all these fancy add-on benefits because of how Medif MA rates are set. They don't have to do the coordination, the, the, the enrollee, and this gets back to what you were just talking about, the enrollee doesn't get the benefits of integration that we've built into these other models but they think they're getting something and they are, they're getting something of value. They're getting these supplemental benefits. That's probably not the most important thing for someone who's duly eligible who may have very complex medical and social needs. So this notion of trying to sort of pull together uh, the uh, elements of, of rate setting, marketing practices, enrollee knowledge, integration, accountability, it all like, comes to a head right in this one place. And I'd say in this one paper, we we have evidence that it it doesn't necessarily come together the way we would want it to, um, to, to, to guide people into what was what's probably the best product to meet their needs. 
So read the paper if you haven't. <laughs> yes, I, I, I have uh, read the paper. No, and this is where, I mean, I will say, Alan, this is why it's so important for us to always be engaging and hearing what's going on on the ground. Healthcare markets are dynamic. And we always have to keep our eyes and ears open to make sure that we can address any issues that come up or where there are things that are going really well. How do we help to facilitate and further you know, scale and expand those things? And so you know, we will definitely be looking into this. That's great. Um, so I'm I'm getting a bunch of questions in from the audience, and I love to bring those in. I'm going to do one now, and I it again the the boundaries between this topic and value based mm -hmm. are 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 thin. But you know, um, as someone like me who's worked most heavily on the Medicaid side, I feel like there's a very robust discussion about meeting social needs for the Medicaid population. Lots of models around it, lots of discussion about it. Obviously, it's a lower income population, more likely to have unmet housing, food security, other kinds of needs. Medicare population has many people with those needs, but also uh, some who are, of course, because it's not income tested, it's not as concentrated. Um, how do you think about sort of the you're within CMS, which has, you know, the Medicaid folks having those conversations. Are you having those same conversations on the Medicare side? And what do they look like? Oh, absolutely. And I, I'll take this from two angles. First, just organizationally speaking, it has been very important to all of us to work across our centers. So, you know, partnering, you know, Medicare partnering with Medicaid and CHIP, where they you know, might have some best practices that could be helpful for us. Partnering with the Innovation Center, where the Innovation Center can be the R&D arm for Medicare and Medicaid, where the Innovation Center can test a model, and if it works, we can think about scaling it in the Medicare program. And even, as we published in Health Affairs uh, yesterday, I think, you know, where we can use the Medicare Shared Savings Program as a chassis for the innovation center to test to enable you know more easy uh, scaling if if something works so organizationally those conversations are constantly ongoing and i think policy wise we are definitely driving hard in that direction really to think about care differently than that traditional fee for service way of providing care and to incorporate it into the fee for service foundation. So for example, in the physician fee schedule that we just put out, we're proposing to pay for community health integration services. The first time ever that Medicare dollars can be used for community health services. And we tie it, you know, as an incident to a billable provider and provide you know, frameworks of they have to have a risk assessment, you know, social needs risk assessment, which by the way, also we are proposing to pay for. But, you know, being able to bring that into the foundational aspects of the Medicare program, I think helps build the muscle memory and the ability for healthcare providers to form these teams, build these teams to enable them to then move into alternative, you know, care models like you know, an accountable care organization, you know, principal illness navigation, we're also proposing to pay for, for care navigation for people with serious illness. So absolutely, we are taking some of what has been, you know, shown to work in other settings and bringing, you know, more into the Medicare program. And it's with an eye towards how do we move towards a more population health focus, where again, we want to have everybody in an accountable care relationship by 2030. That means from the ground up. That doesn't just mean those people who are in, you know, an innovation center, you know, model. It means also how are we driving the very chassis of our program to change the way that we're thinking about healthcare so that you really are addressing people's needs where they are, keeping them healthy, preventing them from getting sick so that you're spending the healthcare dollar in a smarter way and improving outcomes. And this is where your opening comment really comes to play, which is that medic what Medicare does uh, ripples through the entire system. So as you lead in this area, we know that there's a lot else uh, following uh, close behind. Well, look, we're going to, we're going to, uh, continue on these topics a lot, but I do want to bring up the second, at least, uh, which also, of course, we could have an entire conversation about, but that's prescription drugs. Um, 
Let's start with the provisions of the IRA having to do with drug negotiation. Those, of course, very much top of mind in the news. Tell us a little bit about how you think it's going right now. And I'm sure, as I, as usual, I'll follow on with some questions. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I will say it, it follows along the same theme of what we've been talking about with Medicare Advantage and, you know, all the value-based care work. Really, our goal, my goal, is to drive better care to have smarter spending of the Medicare dollar, to address issues of equity, to improve quality. And that is the foundation of the negotiation process that we have put forward in our guidance. So number one, the foundation of drug negotiation, there are various factors that we have to consider that was laid out in the law. And what we have said in our draft guidance and then we finalized was that the clinical benefit of the drug will be that starting point for how to develop an initial offer for the negotiation. Really thinking about what benefit a drug provides to people in comparison to a therapeutic alternative and enabling real world evidence to play a significant role, right? Because these are drugs that have been on market for seven years or you know 11 years that you have the opportunity to have a broader appreciation and view of what impact this drug is having. So being able to, for example, consider if this drug is meeting an unmet need in the community. Does this drug have different impacts for different types of populations so that we can really get to issues of disparities? Thinking about caregivers, if you have a drug that is easier to take, then does that impact, you know, ability to take the medication and ultimate health impacts for someone? We're saying also that we're interested in hearing about workplace productivity, the importance of staying independent, not becoming institutionalized, anywhere that there is rigorous evidence of the benefits of a drug, we absolutely want to be able to consider it because ultimately, why are we all in healthcare? Why does innovation happen? Because we want to have innovations that are going to really drive changes in health. And then from there, we also want to consider things like what's the cost of producing and distributing this drug? You know, what kinds of federal financial support were provided? You know, what's the R&D cost? And again, you know, to incorporate those things as well as we are doing the negotiation. And I think a lot of this just really is in line with the vision for the Medicare program that we've been talking about. And then I mentioned transparency before with Medicare Advantage, and that applies here as well, where we want to be able to get data evidence from everyone, and we're setting up a process whereby there will be uh, patient-focused listening sessions, manufacturer meetings, and then once we send the initial offer, the manufacturer has the ability to do a counter offer, and then if there isn't agreement, then we set up up to three meetings to have an organic back and forth negotiation process where ultimately then we will put forward publicly, you know, what were the factors that went into play? You know, what was some of the, the back and forth? Again, to encourage that transparency, that's also helpful for the healthcare market. So part of the process is this maximum fair price. And when you talk about transparency, are we going to have transparency into what goes into that? Or is that part of the part of the negotiation that's behind doors and is only revealed at the end? So we put out in our in our revised guidance how we want to consider you know, these different factors when we are you know, coming up with an initial offer and moving through the negotiation process. Um, but, you know, we do, it, we are maintaining the flexibility because every drug is different, right? Every drug is different. Patient circumstances are different. And we want to be able to embrace that nuance when we are um, doing negotiations with manufacturers. Um, what we laid out in the guidance, and this was incorporating feedback that we got moving from the you know draft guidance to the final, because as as you commented, you know, Alan, one of the first things I always say is it's important for us to be engaging and hearing from people. And we heard, hey, we you know would like more transparency. So our our CMS says we will do this negotiation process and then you know, publish, you know, at the end. However, at any point along the way, a manufacturer 
can make something public and talk about what's happening in the negotiation. And if they do so, then we can as well. Um, and if they, you know, if they disclose proprietary information publicly, then that means we can now disclose that, you know, proprietary information. So that's kind of how we laid out because obviously there's a balance, right? That um, transparency, but also respecting proprietary information and confidentiality. Uh, someone who knows a lot more about drug pricing than I do, which is a good number of people, uh, raised to me this issue early on that as you, of course, start with a limited number of drugs, but as the role of, of negotiation increases, the, the dynamics of pricing change dramatically because there's now a, a negotiated price instead of these P, you know, individual PBM negotiated prices, both for the drugs that are covered, but also for the ones that aren't part of the negotiation. Um, how should we think about the, the interplay between Part D, pricing and the and your and CMS's you know uh, processes of negotiation and and how those two together are going to affect what people actually are are paying in the end yeah that's an excellent question I will say that the guidance that we put out is for the first year of the negotiation program so it is for the round of negotiation that is coming up where the prices apply for the year 2026 and that is because number one, there are other provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that don't apply in the initial year, for example, renegotiation. Um, so we did not address those right now because we certainly have timelines that we are trying to meet right now. And also to some of what we've been talking about, the healthcare market is dynamic. And I think we all need to learn and work together and see how things develop so that we can adjust our you know, policies accordingly. Um, so that's kind of one aspect that I think is important to remember that this is for the first year. We asked, you know, in our guidance for comment on that interplay between, you know, formulary negotiations that the PBMs do in the Part D program and, you know, our negotiation. And we incorporated that feedback into our revised guidance where we state, stated that, you know, it is our goal that there is meaningful access to these negotiated drugs. And we have processes in CMS based on the Medicare law where formularies cannot be discriminatory. They need to be grounded in clinical rationale. So if a Part D plan is going to put a negotiated drug on a non-preferred tier or have utilization management for that negotiated drug, we expect you know, a justification and an explanation of why that is being done. And that explanation should meet these criteria that we have in law as part of our normal formulary review process so that we can make sure that formularies are continuing to be non-discriminatory and to be clinically appropriate. I just have to say as an observer, uh, it will be interesting to see the dynamics of the use of the word negotiation and how after we've actually been through a round or maybe it'll take two or three, I'm thinking of the new ACA marketplaces, of, of whether this is really price setting or whether there really is a negotiation. And of course, the talking points have been lined up for years on this, but, uh, but I, um, uh, it, it will be interesting to see whether in the end there is a, a robust negotiation and then how people characterize what happened and whether they characterize it the same way, depending on which side of the table they were sitting on. That is absolutely our goal is to have a robust negotiation process. And that is what we have detailed out in the guidance that we that we put forward to have this back and forth, you know, and we talked with what happens right now, right? There's negotiation that happens in the commercial markets. There's negotiation that happens with DOD, with VA, with the public health service, you know, Indian health service. And we sought out um, ideas and suggestions and experiences from all of those areas in which negotiation happens today to help inform, you know, how we're setting up this negotiation process. Well, I know we'll come back to this topic every time we meet. Um, but there are some other drug uh, 
prescription drug issues that I want to make sure we talk about, not just the negotiation, mm-hmm. although it's, of course, front and center right now. I mean, one is the coverage of these very high cost drugs for high prevalence diseases. So we have this in Alzheimer, we have it in uh, weight loss. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, we've seen the effect of these new drug approvals on Medicare premiums. Um, we've seen what seems to me and to some others to be sort of a, a, a sense that we're going to try to find a, a, a partial coverage option, the evidence development pathways to uh, coverage with evidence so that we're not just opening the floodgates, but we're, we're, we're also um, uh, not saying we're denying care. Uh, help me understand how you think, I know, again, I'll go back to your sort of the legal structure, the regulatory structure, the practice mm-hmm. on the ground. Obviously, you have significant legal constraints with respect to how you treat uh, uh, drugs that have been uh, approved by the FDA. But within those constraints, you have a number of different ways to go. And I wonder if you could say a little more about how you think, uh, how how you approach the high cost, high prevalence drugs, and also how you approach um, some of the expedited review and whether that's a factor in how you uh, uh, consider your options. So yeah, I'll I'll start with the new drug law because I think that there are those provisions definitely help with issues of affordability with drugs. And then I'll move to, you know, more on the, the coverage decisions and such. So I think it's important to remember that in we talked about the negotiation aspect of the new drug law, but also the entire design of the Part D benefit is being redone where number one, there will be an out-of-pocket cap for what people have to pay, $2,000 in 2025, which is huge. There's never been a a limit to what someone could pay out-of-pocket in the Part D program. The $0 vaccines that's in place right now, the $35 insulin copay cap that's in place right now, and also the expansion of the low-income subsidy program to 150% of poverty. The Part D redesign also changes the dynamics between the plan, the manufacturer, and the government, which can be a whole separate deep dive into weeds of health econ you know, 201, which we don't need to get into. However, I think it just at a high level is important to remember that the dynamics of the entire market are going to change. And this is something that we will be examining and that we hope to partner with others and hear what examinations and analyses they're doing in that space. But I think that Part D redesign is important to remember as we're talking about affordability of drugs and and cost of drugs. And then the negotiation where if there is a drug that has been on the market for seven years or 11 years and qualifies as a drug that does not have competition and it rises in the gross expenditure for Medicare, it could be subject to negotiation, which also then, you know, provides an opportunity to make sure that we're spending the Medicare dollar in a smart way. And the other aspect of the of uh, the drug law is inflation rebates, where if a drug company raises prices faster than inflation, then they pay a rebate back to the Medicare program. That's another angle for addressing the high cost of drugs. So, you know, we talk a lot about negotiation with the IRA, but also the elements of the redesign of the Part D program and the inflation rebates can also have that effect on drug costs. You know, then moving to, you know, some examples you gave, you know, the all the the national coverage decisions that are done in the Medicare program do not consider cost. They are based on clinical efficacy and patient safety. And with the recent example of Alzheimer's, it really was around how do we make sure that we are getting the evidence that we need? I mean, ultimately, we all want to make sure, coming back to what we were talking about, where there's an opportunity to look at real world evidence, right? We want to make sure that we are continuing to get the best evidence so that we can continue to evaluate what's working, what isn't. And so hence having that registry, um, you know, for uh, the Alzheimer's drugs that you can continue to collect data that would be very helpful given that, you know, this is a very important population to be looking at. I think you might have also seen that the Innovation Center just 
um, announced a new care model for people with dementia as well. So, you know, we're trying to address these aspects from multiple angles. And then, you know, you mentioned the, the weight loss drugs. This comes back to, you know, Medicare law and administrative authorities, because there is in the Medicare law, it says that Part D does not cover drugs for weight loss. You know, where these drugs are being used to treat diabetes, things like that, if there's another indication, I mean, that is something that, you know, absolutely gets covered. And again, this is an area that we continue to partner with FDA and others where it's very important that you continue to collect the evidence base about where different drugs are having an impact to determine where it makes sense for them to be utilized. So I, I appreciate everything you said, and I'm thinking as I listen, you know, you're absolutely right. We're re fundamentally redesigning the Part D benefit. Um, and it it has to happen on both sides, and it does, but at different paces, which is not surprising. You described the patient out-of-pocket protections, which are, of course, huge from a patient perspective. From a taxpayer perspective, limiting the cost sharing just shifts the cost over to the taxpayer who has to pay. And then you've got things like the inflation provisions and the drug negotiation, mm -hmm. but that doesn't get us, those two provisions don't solve the problem. They, they, they take a, 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 you know, a bite out of the corner of the problem starting in a few years from now. So um, I, 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 it will be interesting to me, I guess I'll say to watch whether the evolution on the, on the trust fund uh, protection side is as fast as the evolution on the uh, patient side, because if we don't catch up on the payer, uh, then then we have a whole different set of problems, no matter how much we try to protect people through limiting their cost share. I guess that wasn't a question, but uh, you're always welcome to, to react to. Um, and I appreciate the clarification on, uh, on the, the weight loss drugs. We know that from the law, but it also does sort of go back to this question of navigating between prevention and social, loosely called social needs and social determinants and clinical medicine. And so much of the Medicare program because of when it was enacted and its long history is so focused on specific diagnosis. And so you can say, well, for, for diabetes, yes, for obesity, no, and that, uh, seems like we're gonna to have to start breaking down some of those barriers as well if we're going to, to uh, prevent costs as well as just jump in at the end. Well, look, uh, I, we've, we've uh, as I knew would happen, we've covered a lot in our time, but we're also, uh, I don't want to, the clock to run out until we turn to the third item you mentioned at the outset, which is the move to value-based payment. Um, you've covered a number of dimensions of it already in the other topics, whether it's uh, drugs or MA, but uh, why don't we sort of start fresh there and tell tell mm -hmm. uh, our audience what your focus is, and, and we'll finish out our time uh, going a little deeper in those topics. Yeah, and I mean, I would say the same thing applies here as with, you know, our conversation on the new drug law and on Medicare Advantage, where we want ultimately to advance equity, improve access to care, you know, drive innovation for high quality care, and you know, have this be an area so that we can spend the Medicare dollar in a smarter way. And so it's really about transforming care. It's not just about these specific care models, while that is very important as well, but it really is about the whole continuum of what are we doing in the fee-for-service program, because ultimately, what Medicare Part A and B cover, then Medicare Advantage covers, right? So what is Medicare Part A and B covering? Some of this we already talked about. The, you know, proposing the community health integration, the care navigation, right? Also, we are making some of the most significant changes in behavioral health in the history of the Medicare program. We are proposing to create a new benefit, the intensive outpatient program. So currently, in the Medicare program, you can have an acute inpatient hospitalization, psychiatric hospitalization. You can do a partial hospitalization, which is like a psych day hospital. And then the next rung is outpatient therapy. Now, instead, now we're proposing a middle ground where you can have intensive outpatient 
uh, programs. So that's a new benefit that we're proposing to create. We also are proposing, and again, this is thanks to congressional action giving us the authority to be able to do this, to have licensed marriage and family therapists, licensed medical uh, mental health counselors, including addiction counselors, to become enrollable and billable providers in the Medicare program, which is huge in terms of expanding access to care. All of these things, you know, moving towards this more team-based approach where you're getting more providers into Medicare, where you're creating new benefits, this is again part of transforming care in a way that can then hopefully enable providers to also be more successful in moving towards these alternative payment models. And we're really trying to drive growth in these alternative payment models. So the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which is under the Center for Medicare, is the largest accountable care organization program in the country. Right? We have more than 10 million uh, people with Medicare in this, in this program. And we have made changes to the program, again, in response to feedback that we have gotten and information that we've gotten from those who are living and breathing this program. We've made changes to the financial benchmark so that we can encourage more people to come in and encourage them to stay in the program. And we just proposed changes to attribution as well. Because again, as we are moving towards a more team-based and holistic approach to care, if someone sees a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant as their primary care as their primary care provider, that should count for determining if that person is a member of that accountable care organization. So we've, you know, proposed changes like that to further encourage, you know, participation in these programs because we really want to grow the providers and the people who are in these programs. We also launched um, this advanced investment payment program, taking something that worked in the Innovation Center. Um, it was a model they tested, the ACO investment model, where they provided upfront investment dollars to providers so they could invest in the infrastructure that they need to participate in an accountable care organization. Well, that model worked, so we're scaling it in the Medicare program. So now small providers in rural and underserved areas can get upfront money that they can use to invest in teams, to contract with a community-based organization to address social needs of their patients so that they can become an accountable care organization. So we are taking various policy levers to be able to grow the participation in you know, these value-based care arrangements as well. And it's all, again, with an eye towards driving that vision that we've been talking about. Because I, I really think that these holistic care models and I say this from personal experience because I was leading care transformation at a health system before. I mean, it's incredible when you can have a community health worker who is going to someone's house and actually seeing what's happening on the ground. And, you know, maybe someone doesn't speak English and doesn't have family members to go and pick up a prescription for them. You know, and how do we address those things that can really impact someone's health? And that's where these, these holistic care models have a lot of power to keep people healthy and ultimately you're spending the dollar in the smarter way. Well, I um, I was just about to ask you, and then you beat me to it because we've talked a lot at the 30,000, I think you said 50, the 50,000 and 20,000 foot level. We haven't talked as much and that's where you come from and that's where yeah. you have a lot of connections. So I wanna ask, uh, you know, the first time we had this, I finished with questions about your career and the like. I won't ask you to repeat those, but I, I do think it's very important as much as we talk about policy and theory and all of this and programs, all, all the stuff that I love and you do too, that we also remind people that you came into this job as a clinician and as 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 in charge of transformation for a system. And so I, my questions are are to try to, sort of pull some of what you've been talking about down into that, or, or or I should say maybe build a bridge between those. So, you know, I've been doing what I do for a while and I often had the sense pre-COVID that we were asking a lot of the healthcare system to transform itself, to rethink what its goals were, to rethink how it relates to patients and we had electronic health records and that was you know going to change sort of the, the the focus it's not the 15 minute visit it's the you know the health of the population 
and there was some enthusiasm, there was some resistance, but but certainly those who were enthusiastic and that's the world you were in were, were like, here's some new tools and let's get into this, but it's hard work, it's exhausting, it takes a lot of resources. Then we go into COVID and COVID is exhausting and everyone's working hard and it takes a lot of resources, it takes a lot of energy in the health system. And now as the burden of COVID on the health system per se is abating, we still have a lot of residual effects in the system, burnout, uh, uh, cost pressures, and you know, just again, some exhaustion. And so this is sort of a, 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 again, I'm asking you to sort of both step back and lean way in. When you're out there, talking to folks who are in the jobs you were in, is it, we've been working at this so long and we're, we're tired and we need a break and you keep asking us to do more and to change what we're doing. And can you please just let us like go to work for a, a, a six months or a year without having some bold new agenda? Or is it, Okay, you know, we we were making great progress. COVID came along, it threw us off our game. Now that we feel those pressures aren't there as as great on us, we're eager to get back in it and we're ready to go. What what do you hear? Well, I actually think it's a third thing, Good. which Even is better. that the pandemic really exposed all of the ways that our healthcare system has been broken. And it's, you know, things that a lot of us knew working in healthcare, but it really was brought to the forefront. And so where, you know, where there is uh, burnout, where there are, you know, people saying that I want to be able to take care of my patients. And I feel like I'm not able to in the current environment where there's that opportunity for us to be able to support that. And very much, I one of the best parts of my job is being able to travel and visit clinics and visit people and talk with them. And I ask them, what can I do to help you, right? Like, what can I, what can we do to enable you to take care of people the way you want to take care of people? Um, and, you know, a lot, we all have that, collect those collective, goals. Um, and so I think that's where, you know, a lot of the things that I've been talking about, about community health workers and, you know, increasing access to behavior, behavioral health providers, those are all steps to A, alleviate the burden on like one person, right, by enabling a community to really care for people. B, that tends to be more effective, as we know, which can also help with that sense of agency that you can actually do something to help people, um, which is why, you know, a lot of us go into healthcare um, in the first place. So I actually think that it has presented an opportunity and it is very important to me that we do keep in mind how policies can actually play out on the ground. So engaging people as we're developing policies to say, hey, what's working and what could work and what won't work. So that we're incorporating those on the ground perspectives as we're developing the policies. But then once we finalize a payment rule, you know, it's important how the, that comes, into, comes to life on the ground. So being able to, for example, with value-based care, really leveraging the ACO learning network so people can learn from each other, helping to forge connections between public health departments and providers or community-based organizations and traditional healthcare providers. So that it's not, the goal is not just to put out a policy. The goal is to actually, you know, have care happen and having that partnership on the ground is, is critical to that. So I think I'm gonna squeeze one more question in before we mm -hmm. close. I, I, I really hear everything you're saying and it's funny, someone just sent a question in right at the end that, that that's a little different than my own but I'll, I'll try to weave the two together. Mm -hmm. You, the passion, I love the passion you bring and, I, and I'm sure you bring out that passion in the people you come and visit or you go and visit and you hear it from them. And I, I have no doubt that it's genuine. My work in this area has led me to believe that they're actually, a lot of people who aren't ready for this transition, who aren't as enthusiastic, who haven't been trained in team-based care, who are 
we who view us as loading more and more onto the primary care clinicians who are sort of the linchpin of of some of the things you describe. And so that I I don't I, I don't want to lose that part of it too. So I yeah. guess the question is, I get it that if you're enthusiastic and you're you see this as uh, the pandemic is opening your eyes to how much better we need to do, and you feel like you can be part of a a learning system and all of that, and that's very motivating. But I know there are folks out there who don't have the same energy and passion for this as you do, and they're also you know they're clinicians and they're doing their job and they're doing their best. How how do we support them as well as we support those who are already sort of at the front of the pack? Well, I'm, I'm glad that you raised that question because it comes back to something we were talking about, that it's not just about people who are at the forefront in these, you know, advanced models. It's about what are we doing with the everyday and the day-to-day. And that's why some of the changes that we're proposing in the physician fee schedule are important. Like you mentioned primary care. We're proposing an add-on payment to acknowledge and value the complexity that's associated with longitudinal primary care. So really on the ground in the very foundation of the program, trying to provide those supports where we can. You know, where with GME, we're rolling out 200 new GME slots a year and focusing on rural and underserved areas so that you can get you know, more people training in in the areas that need them. Because you're right, it's, believe me, I know, it is not all, you know, roses and rainbows and unicorns, right? And so we have to address things along the entire continuum, however we can. And also, it's not solely the Medicare program, right? Like we are partnering with HRSA, for example, with workforce grants, that they have with administration for community living with their area agencies on aging to make sure that you know supports are being provided and having good you know outreach it it is a combination of many things together that will help to you know support people on the ground caregivers patients um as we continue to tackle you know some of these really complex issues but always remembering that these are all people Right. I mean, when we talk about those more than 64 million people in the Medicare program, each one of those is a person. Right. And also remembering that there are communities, families, caregivers, you know, healthcare providers who are taking care of that person who are also people who are also in, you know, that that ecosystem. And what can we do within our power to be able to support everyone in that way? Well, it's uh, always a pleasure, and uh, I'm sorry to see our hour is coming to an end, but it just means we'll do this again. Yes. For our audience, I just want to remind you, we have on August 22nd, a journal club focused on an, a paper in our August issue uh, on home visits with a registered nurse not affecting prenatal care use or pregnancy health among Medicaid enrollees. This is an insider event. Insider is a membership program that offers exclusive access to content beyond the journal, including events, uh, newsletters, and various other activities. Uh, We hope you've enjoyed this uh, program here. We'll have other events you won't wanna miss. Sign up to receive reminders at healthaffairs.org. And at this point, I can say both. Uh, Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Dr. Sashimani for Uh, being uh, with me on our Policy Spotlight. And thank you for being my guest today on A Health Podacy. And to our audience, if you're listening to us in one forum, we hope you'll come and hear what we have to say in the other. Uh, We have many ways to get our health policy information out to the audience. But uh, Mina, thank you for your service to the country and for being my guest. It's been a, a pleasure to spend the hour with you. Thank you again for having me, Alan.